So my name's Susie, I'm a physicist, I'm an accelerator physicist and I work at the University of Oxford. I run a research group there in actually high intensity hadron particle accelerators and I actually spend half my time at Harwell campus as this previous uh, speaker was talking about. Um, I'm also a member of the ISIS neutron and muon source, uh, not the other ISIS, <laughs> just, <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> Um, so, so what I'm going to talk about today is the fascinating world, and I really think it's wonderful, of particle accelerators. Um, so just to get a handle on, on who I have in the audience, um, has anyone heard of a particle accelerator before? Good, I'm in safe hands, that's great. Um, has anyone heard of a particle accelerator other than the Large Hadron Collider? Ooh, a lot of you, great, okay. We actually have two at Harwell, by the way. Um, and if, if you were pushed, could you give a back-of-the-envelope explanation of how a particle accelerator works? Anyone? Ooh, a couple of... Ah, actually, okay, a few brave souls. Great, thank you. Okay, that gives me a really good background um, before we get going. So most people now, when I say particle accelerator, think of this one. This is the behemoth. This is the Large Hadron Collider. Um, it is almost 27 kilometres in circumference, which is why the tunnel looks almost straight. Uh, it's about 100 metres underground between, uh, uh, over the border between France and Switzerland. Uh, it's uh, m inside these magnets here, these big blue long ones. Um, it's one of the coldest places in the universe at 1.9 degrees above absolute zero. And um, it accelerates two beams of protons from inside the atom in opposite directions at 99.999999%, that's the exact number, um, of the speed of light, and smashes them into each other. And it is um, what I like to call an impressive, shiny, huge piece of kit that's bigger than everyone else's. <laughs> <laughs> this, however, is only one particle accelerator in the world, and there are actually about 35,000 of them. And later in my talk, you'll see what some of the other ones are used for. Right, so why was that particular one built? Now, I don't have time to give you a crash course in particle physics. Are there any particle physicists in the room, by the way? No, right, I'm safe, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm, I used to be one and then I switched field. So the reason the Large Hadron Collider was built was in order to really investigate the fundamental constituents of matter. And when it really comes down to it, inside the atom, um, there are only actually three different types of particles, which are the up and down quarks, they're the constituents of protons and neutrons inside the atom, and the electron. Everything else there plays very little role in our day-to-day -day lives, but over about the last century, we've discovered that all of these particles fit together in a neat theory that describes our universe to something like nine or ten decimal places. It is an incredible amount of discovery and work that's gone into it, and I cannot do it justice in about two minutes flat. But the latest piece that we've discovered using the Large Hadron Collider, and one of the reasons, but not the only reason that it was built, was to discover this guy up over the side here that's called the Higgs boson. Um, and the way that we've learned all of this stuff about the universe is by taking the particles mostly and smashing them into each other and literally seeing what comes out. Now, if you take Einstein's equation E equals mc squared, E is energy, m is a mass, and c is 299,792,458 metres per second. So that squared, I'd have to get Siri to tell me what that is, but um, that's a very big number, right? So it takes an enormous amount of energy to create even a tiny, tiny amount of matter. So that's why, over the years, our machines have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and reached up to higher and higher energies <coughs> in order to create particles of higher and higher masses now, that might seem slightly counterintuitive, but if we look down um, at the low energy scale, we get our sort of everyday uh, objects. And in fact, up, up here in sort of 10 MeV, which is like a sort of everyday energy scale, um, are the up and down quarks where our protons and neutrons uh, are created from. And if we go up in energy scale, we slowly discover and over time discovered all these other types of quarks and leptons and all these other things that seem to play no role in our everyday lives. And if you go up and up and up and up, we understand how the different forces in the universe work from uh, electromagnetism to the strong and weak nuclear force. And then finally, right at the top, we get to this Higgs thing, which is 
the theory behind why all of the other particles in the standard model have a mass. So the, the amazing thing about this collection of particles, which admittedly looks arbitrary until, until you learn it in more detail, is that you can take the entire description of every known particle and interaction other than gravity in the universe and write it down on a mug. And this is called the, uh, the standard model Lagrangian, the L, curly L at the start is for a Lagrangian. Um, so if any of you studied physics at university, you may have come across this. Um, and there's lots of different components of that. Now, if I write it out in full, I get what is the most egotistical physics t-shirt in the entire world. <laughs> so if I write it out in full, um, this is, sorry, it's fuzzy, but really you don't need to read it, I promise. Um, all of the different terms in that equation describe an interaction between different types of particles and force carriers. And you may have seen uh, in, in the news, when the LHC was in the news, diagrams that look a little bit like this. These are called Feynman diagrams after the famous physicist Richard Feynman. And so what we do, what most of my colleagues in particle physics do, is they take this equation, they figure out which particles are interacting and how, what's coming in, what's coming out. They do 21 pages of calculations and they come out with a number that is the probability of that interaction happening. And depending on which particles go in, you choose a different term that corresponds to those, and which particle comes out, you choose a different term that corresponds to those, turn the handle, and you get your result at the other end. I've just taught you quantum field theory in about two seconds. Um, <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's really hard to convey in a few minutes how amazing it is that we know this about the universe and the predictive power that it has. And that is the reason why we really built the Large Hadron Collider. But I am not anymore a particle physicist. I'm a particle accelerator physicist. And so it's my job to understand how to build the machines that we use in this field. And so I want to briefly run down for those of you who couldn't give an explanation as to how they work, how these amazing machines actually operate. And I want to go back to about uh, the late 1920s and, and 1930s um, when a new type of particle accelerator was invented called the cyclotron. Um, these are still in operation today, but the original ones, this is the patent from a guy called Ernest Lawrence. And this is, is uh, two um, Ds, as we call them, electrical, uh, electrical uh, cavities, um, which would sit inside a whopping great magnet, and I'll show you a picture on the next slide. And what we do is we start in the centre with some particles, and they always have to be charged particles, so either you know, electrons, protons, you know, charged ions, charged atoms, things like that. And we give them a bit of a kick because there's a voltage between these two halves here. And each time the particles travel between those two halves, um, they get a little bit of, of, of a kick, a little bit of energy. Now, because they're sitting in a whopping great magnetic field, the effect that that has on a, on a charged particle is to actually bend it around a corner. Um, so it bends around a corner and it comes back again, crossing uh, this, this gap, gaining a little bit more energy. And as you can see, quite obviously in the diagram, as it continues to gain energy, it spirals out from the machine. So the limit in the energy in this machine is mostly how big you can build your magnet and how much iron you're willing to afford. Um, now, this, this really was the original type of um, sort of high-energy particle accelerator, and this is a photograph of um, Ernest Lawrence and his student, Milton Stanley Livingston, who, I should say, actually built the thing. Um, and, uh, and this machine got up to about one million electron volts. Now, in, in physics, I use this, uh, this energy range of electron volts, which means the energy that an electron would gain if I put it through the potential of one volt. Um, so MeV is million electron volts. Uh, and, and that's the scale of that one that they're standing next to there. So we still use a few cyclotrons, but most of the machines that people talk about, especially in the media, are a different type of machine, which we call a synchrotron. And we have two of these types of machines at the Rutherford Lab um, at Harwell. Uh, one is the Isis neutron source uh, that I'm associated with, and there's also the diamond light source that some of you may have heard of. Now, synchrotrons um, are, are fascinating machines. The original idea was actually from an Aussie, yes, uh, <laughs> called uh, Marcus Oliphant. Uh, and the idea here instead, is instead of um, having particles that start in the centre and spiral outwards, instead, you keep the particles confined to one um, radius, one, one torus, 
And as the particles gain energy, you increase the field in the magnets, the magnetic field, in time with the energy gain in order to keep them going around the same, the same path. That's, that's the basic uh, explanation. If you look at a real one, and this is a photograph that I took um, of the Isis uh, synchrotron, there are 10 sections that look almost identical to this. And you have these big yellow magnets you can see at the top and bottom there. They're what we call dipole magnets. They bend the beam around. Um, and then there's two other main components. There are quadrupole magnets, which I'll show you in a minute. And there's also what we call a radio frequency cavity. Um, now, this is, is basically a big uh, box like your microwave um, into which we pump electromagnetic waves. And it sets up a standing wave inside there. And you have to time the voltage of that standing wave with the passage of the particles in order to get them to accelerate. Now, it's not obvious to most people how this acceleration mechanism of using a wave to accelerate particles actually works. So I have a little demonstration here of an everyday example where I can use a wave to accelerate some particles. And uh, if I just pop it on. And um, for those of you who can't see that low, I've just got a video up here, which hopefully will, if I wake my phone up, will work. Good, it's nice when technology works. All right, um, one of the people before who said they knew how accelerators worked, who, who were you? <laughs> <laughs> I need a volunteer. It's going to be fun, don't worry. All right, cool. What's your name? Patrick. Sorry? Patrick. Patrick, grab that. This is just an, an ordinary fluorescent tube that you have in the, in the ceiling, so don't smash it. Um, over here I have a plasma ball, which has a 30 uh, kilohertz um, oscillating AC voltage supply. So there's a voltage, and it's a couple of kilovolts, that's going up and down, up and down, up and down in the centre of that thing, 30,000 times a second. And because of that, out of the plasma ball, as well as looking pretty, um, I'll ignore that for now, uh, comes an electromagnetic wave that's, that's um, travelling sort of through space. So, Patrick, could you uh, move towards the plasma ball and trying to get yourself in shot of the camera would be great. Um, point the fluorescent tube towards the plasma ball. Can you see what's happened? Yeah. So actually, if you move it away, notice that it's still on. Now, a lot of people show this demonstration with the fluorescent tube touching the plasma ball and say it's something about plasma and completing a circuit or something or other. It's not. It's the electromagnetic wave that's coming out of that device, which is travelling through the uh, the a fluorescent tube, exciting the electrons inside, they smash into the side, emitting, okay, it's infrared first, and then there's invisible, and you know how a fluorescent tube works. Um, you're enjoying that, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. Try something for me. Um, try, try switching it on by holding it near again, and then hold it halfway down. Yeah, cool, huh? You can like, switch, it, switch it on and off. So, yeah, you can move your hand up and up. And, yeah, that's it. Yeah, because you're, you're stopping, you're, you're then, you are then grounding any electrons which are sort of moving inside there effectively by doing that. Thank you, Patrick. Give him a massive round of applause. Yeah. Cheers. Okay, so, um, so that's one example of how uh, a wave can be used to accelerate particles. But I thought you were the kind of people who needed a bit of waking up on, on th this afternoon. So I've brought along some scale model protons. And I thought what I'd get you to do is for you guys to be the wave. And the scale model protons are going to accelerate across the wave. So first, we have to practice the wave. All right? 11-year-olds do this really well, I'm warning you. You've got competition. So. <laughs> I'm going to start at this end. We're going to do an audience wave across to that side. I'm going to do a three, two, one, and then we're going to go. All right? So three, two, one, go. Whoa. Very nice, very nice. Now, if anyone's in the back there, can you grab the scale model protons, which I think it should be obvious what I'm referring to. Um, <laughs> yes, the giant beach balls that I placed up the back earlier. <laughs> and if you can hand them to people on the end of this row, that would be wonderful. And... Um, Try not to hit the projector, all right? <laughs> Just, I'm sure they're insured. So this is, so unfortunately, because of radiation protection, I couldn't bring a real particle accelerator for my talk today. So that's why I've decided to turn you into one instead. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go three, two, one. We're gonna do, do that again and see if we can get them to accelerate to the other side. Ready? Three, two, one, go. Ah, ah. <laughs> should have watched my stuff, shouldn't I? Ah, ah, very nice, very nice, well done. <laughs> okay.
Okay, so uh, can we actually hang on to those? Because we're going to reuse those in a second for another part of the accelerator. Okay, so, so uh, that's um, approximately how a particle accelerator works. Yeah, um, no, so, uh, I mean, you guys are a rubbish accelerator, but we do that very, very precisely, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and so what happens uh, in the synchrotron then is you have to time that wave uh, very, very precisely with the timing of the increase in the magnetic field in order to get the particles um, all synchronised and that's why we call it a, a synchrotron. Um, and here's an image, a little hard to see on this screen, um, of the, a, a sort of cutaway of the Large Hadron Collider radio frequency cavity, uh, which is one of the devices, and this actually operates at a superconducting temperature, um, at 400 megahertz, this one. Uh, and, and this is one of the devices into which we pump a, a large amount of um, RF energy, send the particles through, and um, as they go through, uh, as you demonstrated very nicely, they gain a little bit of energy um, as they go. Um, this is actually a real one. It did bring something real. This is actually the smallest radio frequency accelerating cavity in the world. Um, don't steal it. Thank you. Uh, this one is from a project called the Compact Linear Collider, which is uh, one idea of the next generation of colliders to, to reach even uh, more precise measurements in particle physics. Um, and the inside of this thing is machined to a submicron precision, um, but the thing I want to point out is that there's a hole at the end, right? This one's for electrons, which are a very small beam, so it can be a very small hole. Um, and they travel through there. These are the ports into which the RF um, is, sorry, these are the RF ports, these are the vacuum ports. Um, and, and this thing would uh, give uh, an electron an energy gain of up to, pr this one's probably about 10 uh, million electron volts. This is also a very, very high gradient cavity, so it gives a lot of energy in a very small space. Um, I'm going to leave it here, but if you'd like to look at it afterwards, you're welcome to. Um, so, yeah, the higher frequency, the smaller they get. Um, that's why that one operates at 30 gigahertz. Um, it was actually so small and the machining tolerances were so tight that they've actually decided to go for 12 gigahertz instead of a slightly larger one because it makes the engineering slightly easier, which is how I managed to nab that one because I don't need it. Um, <laughs> right. So... Um, so in something like a synchrotron, you, uh, you actually uh, adjust the magnets um, in time with uh, usually some kind of enormous tuned resonance circuit, uh, and you would inject at the low point of the magnetic field, at the low point of the, the circuit, um, which usually uh, has a sinusoid because it's easier, um, and then you'd accelerate and increase the field as you accelerate, and then you'd extract at the top um, with the highest magnetic field, um, and then reset the field, and you would go again. But there's actually um, an extra element to an accelerator that most people don't get to in one of these talks, which is why I thought for you guys, let's, let's get to it because it's fascinating, which is all of that thing that I've described works really, really well if you have one ideal particle directly on the orbit that you're looking for. Um, but if you have a particle with an energy that's slightly off that, that, uh, that ideal energy, or if you have um, a particle that's slightly displaced from that, um, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> your particle gets lost. Uh, and in reality, we have beams, right? We have uh, millions or billions, even hundreds of billions in some machines, of particles all travelling through there at the same time. And don't forget they're all charged, which means... A, you know, and charged particles actually repel each other as well, so there's a force that's trying to push them, push them out of there. So we actually need focusing systems in these accelerators as well. <clears throat> and in a synchrotron, that's provided using what we call a quadrupole magnet, because it has four poles, uh, opposing poles, north, south, south, north. Um, and the effect that that magnet has on a beam, and if you, if you did high school physics and you remember doing this at all, you can convince yourself over time that this is true. If you have a charged bunch of particles, it actually squeezes it in one dimension and pulls it out in the other. So it only focuses in one dimension at once. Um, and it's not possible to focus charged particles using a magnet like, uh, using any magnet in both dimensions at once. Um, so what we do instead is we have a um, series of magnets focusing, defocusing, focusing, defocusing, so opposite fields, laid out around the ring. And what this gives us is, is a concept called strong focusing. Um, and you can even convince yourself of this with a series of lenses if you want, that if you have focusing and then defocusing in order, uh, then you actually get a stronger focusing effect than you would if you had, in the lens case, one single focusing lens, which is very, very useful to us. And so if you were to sit on the beam as it goes through these magnets, what you would actually see is this 
kind of behaviour happening in an idealised case. That it's actually, it's not a static thing at all. It's, um, it's sort of squishing and spreading around. And people like me spend our days figuring out how to get that to happen with all the complexities of a real system without losing one in a million of those particles, which is a very, very challenging thing to do. Um, so what I thought I wanted to do <coughs> next is actually get you guys to try and demonstrate this. Now, I've never done this before, but I think you're talented enough to get it to happen. I want to split the audience into four and get you doing that opposite wave that those magnets are doing. So up, down, up, down, and see if we can get the particles to focus in the center. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought it would be great fun. And um, I'm going to record it, by the way. So, uh, <laughs> so let me, just give me one second. I'll just get that going. Um, OK, so I'm going to split you uh, by, from this gentleman here in that row. Uh, behind that row is a different section. And then I'll split you in the center here, OK? So I'm going to call you. Uh, so there's north and south, right? So there's, I'm going to call you north, and I'm going to call you south. So opposite quadrants, right? And what we'll do is, is, is um, the north and the south will be opposite in their, in their waves. So, you, so north people go up, and all the north people, can you demonstrate? Put your hands in the air, while these people have their hands down, and then we swap. Cool. And back. Cool, excellent. This is good. Okay, this is going to work. So I'm going to start the particles in the center, if you can grab that to start with. Now, you people in the center, don't cheat, all right? No cheating. I, I really want to see if this works. <laughs> I mean, you can take one good guess at the answer to that question, right? <laughs> and um, and uh, so what we'll do is we'll start with the north people up and the south people down. And then... Um, and then I'll just say swap continuously, OK? All right, on, on three, OK? So three, two, one, swap, 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 swap. Do you know it's actually working? It's actually working. I'll, I'll stop you there. I'll stop you there. Thank you. <laughs> that, um, that was genuinely an accelerator physics experiment. I've never tried it before. Thank you so much for working with me to do that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I, I'll check the footage later, shall I? But no, really, they did all stay in the centre, and you may have noticed that when ones came flying out, they were actually pushed back towards the centre, so that, that actually worked. Sometimes I do these things with 1,600 kids, so I need a test audience first. <laughs> so thank you. Um, now, in, in fact, I can do that um, in, in uh, here I'm looking down the side of four metal rods on which I'm doing exactly the same thing, and I'm doing it with electric fields instead of magnetic ones. Um, and they're varying at 50 hertz in this particular demonstration, and I have some charged pollen particles, um, which I'm putting into the centre of what's called uh, a pull trap, actually. It's a different device which, which I work on that has a similar system to the one that you were just demonstrating there. And if you, um, yeah, if, if I pop the pollen particles in, in there, you can't see the 50 hertz because the refresh rate on the camera wasn't high enough. But you can see that they are actually confined in, in sort of midair, as it were. Um, and it really does have the effect of, of trapping them and keeping them stable inside the trap or in an accelerator inside um, the magnetic focusing system. Great. OK. So one of the... Uh, one of the things I hear a lot, though, when people, especially when people go and give a talk about the Large Hadron Collider and particle physics is, <coughs> but these things have no practical applications, right? And I, th I think you know the answer to that is no. Uh, so back in 1897, J.J. Um, Thompson actually announced the first discovery of what I would call a you know, fundamental particle, which was the electron. And he actually announced it at the Royal Institution in London. And at the time, he, uh, he, you know, it was a really a fundamental discovery. Um, they didn't know what it would be useful for. 20 years later, he was back with another talk saying industrial applications of electrons. And I'm just going to read this, this out because it's a fascinating um, piece of history that I think is repeating itself over and over again. So he says, if there are among my audience any who 20 years ago listened to the announcement I made here of the existence of electrons, they will, I think, admit that they would have been very sceptical if they'd been told they would, in another 20 years, be listening to another discourse on the commercial applications of those electrons. For electrons are so small that it takes about 1,700 of them 
to give a mass equal to that of an atom of hydrogen. And they move so quickly that they, they get out of the field of operation in a fraction of a million of a second. Um, and their properties appear rather transcendental and not promising from a practical point of view. But as a matter of fact, electrons are now not only in trade circulars, but also in the law courts. Um, so, so what had changed in that 20 years after the, the uh, discovery of, of the electron? Well, people figured out that they are useful. I think anyone who knows about electricity would <laughs> not, really, um, not really debate that fact. But nowadays, we use electrons uh, in accelerators for all kinds of practical applications. And one of the main ones that takes up about 50% of those 35,000 accelerators I told you about is in cancer treatment with using radiotherapy. Uh, so this is a mainstay of cancer treatment. About um, half of all successfully treated cancer cases use um, radiotherapy to do it as part of the, you know, the collection of treatment options. Um, and this then consists of a small linear particle accelerator, which is sitting um, in this device here, which smashes electrons at about 25 million electron volts onto a metal target, and that generates X-rays. Uh, now, those X-rays are then shaped by a complex system of sort of interleaving fingers to the shape of, of the region inside the human body that the doctor would like to treat. And the whole thing is mounted on what we call a gantry, which then rotates 360 degrees around the patient. Um, and this is really the mainstay of cancer treatment that, that we have today. And it's all based on a small sort of metre or two metre long particle accelerator that we have up there. Um, now, at the moment, um, people are looking uh, forward from radiotherapy to say, OK, is, is radiotherapy the best way that we can treat cancer? <coughs> And uh, it, with, you know, with uh, some kind of ionising radiation. And people have discovered over the years, actually starting back in 1945, that it might, it might not be. Um, if I were to plot for you the depth in the human body, in tissue or in water, um, pretty much the same thing, versus the, the dose delivered to you, so the radiation dose, which in this case you want the dose delivered to the area to kill cancer cells, um, and I do that for a photon beam, so X-rays, what you find is that just under the skin is where the peak dose is deposited, and the dose drops off all the way through the body and goes all the way out the other side. Now, this sounds not very useful, especially for something deep inside the body, right? But the way that, and the reason that this, this thing is so complicated and rotates all the way around you um, is to add up fields of radiation from loads of different angles um, in order to, to create the ideal distribution um, exactly where you want it inside the body. And it does a, really a pretty good job. But if instead we use a charged particle, it has a fundamentally different interaction um, with <coughs> tissue and with, with water in, inside the body. So if I use protons instead, one's about 20,000 times lower in energy than the Large Hadron Collider, so about 250 uh, mega electron volts or million electron volts. Um, they actually come in and they don't interact much when they have a high energy, and so they don't deposit much dose on the way in. And then as they slow down, they deposit more and more dose until they stop at the end of their range, depositing most of the dose there. Um, and this gives us this, this characteristic curve, which we call the Bragg peak. And, uh, and this, uh, this Bragg peak um, looks fundamentally different from the X-ray peak, right? Um, and this is, is a very exciting, uh, this was a very exciting discovery in about 1945 because they realised that they could use that very specific um, depth uh, which you can tune based on the starting energy of the beam to actually deliver more dose where they wanted it in the body and less dose in the healthy tissue that they were trying to spare. And this is now um, also an established treatment method. Over 100,000 people have been treated with it around the world. And I think later this year or early next year, the first UK centres, full, full body UK centres, will open. Um, there's one in Manchester and, and one in London um, on the NHS. Uh, and to, to generate these beams, at the moment, most places use um, what, the cyclotron, so the one I talked about earlier. Um, the patient, by the way, sees none of this jazz in the background. Only people like me get excited by it. They see what looks like a normal treatment room with a sort of port that comes out the wall and rotates around them. Um, so this particular um, application is really driving forward um, development of this uh, accelerator technology on the smaller scale, trying to shrink it down. And this is just an example of um, the dose distribution. This is kind of a glamour example. Not all of them are this good. 
you know, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, but I will say it, it's great for some cases. It's not necessary for other cases. Um, but this is an example of a child who had a tumour removed from the base of the skull, and then the, uh, the rest of the spine needs irradiating um, in order to stop that cancer spreading down the spine. With photons, with x-rays, that's the best you can do with a single field because it goes all the way through. Um, but with protons, uh, you can get a dose distribution that obviously spares the rest of the body, um, which is obviously a better thing later in the child's life. <coughs> right. Um, one of the other uh, main medical applications in particular is to generate radioisotopes, such as those you would use in, in a scan, um, like a PET scan. I'll ask more about that later if you like. Um, so that's uh, an increasing use of them in hospitals. Um, but I do want to explain before I finish, because I've only got a few minutes left, um, what the other 50% uh, effectively are of the application. So I'm just going to really quickly go through a few others. So all of us have a smartphone nowadays, right? Inside your smartphone, inside your laptop, there are, you know, the processor chips. On those chips nowadays, the electronics are so small that actually the ions in the substrate need to be deposited individually into individual locations. You can't do that with chemistry you have to do it with what is effectively a miniature particle accelerator. So this is one huge um, uh, application area. Even in things like uh, the security of our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't realise they're there, they're hanging around in the background, but they're being used to do things like scanning cargo uh, using either X-rays or neutrons to discover um, contraband inside it. This is a challenging application because you can't accidentally irradiate someone in, under international law, but it's very, very hard to get a beam to travel all the way through, say, a cargo container. So we have to, to um, weigh up uh, the, the intensity and beam energy required to actually do a good measurement versus what would happen if someone was stowed away inside there because we're not allowed to accidentally irradiate them, um, which is uh, you know, beyond uh, everyday level. Um, a lot of other accelerators are used in industry to do things like sterilisation. Um, most of the medical products that are used in our hospitals uh, uh, have to be sterilised in some way and it's far easier to run a beam of either gamma rays or electrons through it um, than it would be to open it all up and chemically um, wash it and then safely put it back in together. So that kills any unwanted pathogens that might be present. Um, in some places, food is actually irradiated as well. It's actually quite rare in the European Union and in the UK. In the supermarket, I couldn't find one thing, um, by law it has to say, uh, treated with ionising radiation. So if you, if you ever see it, there you go. But you can do things like extend the shelf life of bananas, um, kill salmonella on, on fish and chicken, um, and kill any pathogens that exist in things like herbs and spices, which is a, a very common uh, reason to use that. In the US, if you see that symbol, um, that means it's been treated by ra uh, ionising radiation. It doesn't mean it's organic. <laughs> Um, and just one final one, uh, I could go on for ages about all the multifarious applications of accelerators, but one that I'm um, thinking about for the future is something called an accelerator-driven system, and I'm particularly driven, driven ha, by this um, because it's, it's a potential way that we can actually get rid of our stockpile of nuclear waste around the world um, and reduce uh, its storage lifetime. And we, we do have a problem at the moment with we don't know what to do with our existing stockpile of nuclear waste from, say, the, the US weapons program. So very quickly, the idea is you have a nuclear reactor, a fission reactor, but instead of being critical, it's what we call subcritical. So by itself, it doesn't do anything. And in the core, you can have multiple things, but you could have uranium. You could have something called thorium, which is much more abundant in, in the Earth's crust, doesn't need refinement, etc. And into that, you mix all the high-level nuclear waste that you have from you know, the plutonium from the bombs or the high-level waste from other fission reactors that we also don't know what to do with. Um, and still by itself, it wouldn't do anything. So you, you build a whopping great accelerator, okay, not that whopping, not LHC size, but still pretty big, um, with a very, very high energy and high current proton beam. Sorry, very high current 1 GeV. So actually, to me, it's not that high energy. You whack it into... Um, a heavy metal target inside the reactor, and that undergoes a process called spallation and spits out neutrons in all different directions. And it's those neutrons 
that then drive the nuclear reaction to send all of those isotopes down through their decay chains to reduce the lifetime of that high-level waste from um, hundreds of thousands of years down to a few hundred. Now, you can actually extract energy from that process. It is a reactor. Feed it back into the accelerator. If you want, you can send power to the grid if you have the reliability to do that. If you don't want, you just use it as a transmitter to get rid of your waste. Um, and that means that over, over time, what we could do is reduce um, the, the particle uh, toxicity of these uh, decay products from something like 300,000 years, which is what we're currently having to deal with, how to tell future generations uh, how to stay away from that, um, down to some, something less than 1,000 years. They say between about three and 500 years that it would have to be stored for, which in my view is much less of a future generation <coughs> problem. Um, and you would need... Uh, in the UK, you would need um, sort of one of these per, if we had more reactors, per 10 reactors. So that's, it's about that, um, about that ratio. So in the US, they would need probably five or six of these to get rid of their entire stockpile in about 10 years. Um, and they are slowly, but there are movements to, uh, to build them. China will get there first because they don't have the regulatory issues that we have in the West. Um, and just to finish with, uh, you can even use accelerators to improve the taste of chocolate based on the crystalline structure by studying it using a synchrotron light source. Or you can tell whether or not your very, very expensive bottles of wine are real or fake um, by comparing the, the composition of the glass after um, smashing some ions into it. And that tells you exactly what's in the glass. And you can compare a real one to um, a real known one to a sample one. Um, and there's still a, a massive court case going on for a $500,000 bottle of wine that um, turned out to be fake <laughs> using this analysis. Um, and I will, I will stop there, but if anyone ever asks you um, why a, a particle accelerator might be useful, um, I'll, I'll put that back on at the end and you can memorise it for future use. Um, <laughs> right. And, and I'll stop there and take some questions. Thank you very much for your attention.